Write yourself a letter. Here is an idea to help you get started. Sit down and write yourself a letter, telling the things you always intended to do as though they had already been accomplished. Some personal, some charitable, and others community projects. Write the letter as if a biographer were writing about the wonderful person you really are when you come under the influence of PMA. But don't stop there. Use the secret of getting things done. Respond to the self-starter. Do it now. Remember, regardless of what you have been or what you are, you can be what you want to be if you act with PMA. The self-starter, do it now, is an important self-motivator. It is the important step toward understanding and applying the principles of the next chapter entitled, How to Motivate Yourself. Pilot number eight, thoughts to steer by. One, it is better for people to do something and pay nothing than to pay dues and do nothing. Two, too often what we read and profess becomes a part of our libraries and our vocabularies instead of becoming a part of our lives. Stop and think about this. You have knowledge of principles that could help you achieve any worthwhile goal in life you might desire. But do you make these principles a part of your life? 3. Sow an action and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. What habits of thought or action in any human activity would you like to acquire? What habits would you like to eliminate? You should know how to acquire desirable habits and eliminate the undesirable if you have learned how to recognize principles revealed to you in this book and apply them. 4. The secret of getting things done is do it now. 5. As long as you live, when the suggestion do it now flashes from your subconscious to your conscious mind to do that which you ought to do, immediately follow through with desirable action. It's a habit that will make you an outstanding achiever. 6. The burden of learning is upon the person who wants to learn. If you want to learn how you can achieve anything in life that doesn't violate the laws of God or the rights of your fellow men, now is the time to begin to study and learn the concepts that can teach you how to achieve your goals. Study and apply the principles contained in Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude. Don't only read what is written. 7. Now is the time to act. Do it now. Chapter 9. How to Motivate Yourself What is motivation? Motivation is that which induces action or determines choice. It is that which provides a motive. A motive is the inner urge only within the individual, which incites him to action, such as an instinct, passion, emotion, habit, mood, impulse, desire, or idea. It is the hope or other force which starts an action in an attempt to produce specific results. Motivating Yourself and Others When you know principles that can motivate you, you will then know principles that can motivate others. Conversely, when you know principles that can motivate others, you will then know principles that can motivate you. How to motivate yourself is the purpose of this chapter. How to Motivate Others is the purpose of Chapter 10. How to Motivate Yourself and Others with a Positive Mental Attitude is the purpose of Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude. In essence, this is a book on motivation. Our purpose in illustrating specific experiences of the success and failures of others is to motivate you to desirable action. Now, therefore, to motivate yourself, try to understand principles that motivate others. To motivate others, try to understand principles that motivate you. Establish the habit of motivating yourself with PMA, at will. And then you can direct your thoughts, control your emotions, and ordain your destiny. Motivate yourself and others with the magic ingredient. What is the magic ingredient? One man in particular found it. Here is his story. Some years ago, 
This man, a successful cosmetic manufacturer, retired at the age of 65. Each year thereafter, his friends gave him a birthday party, and on each occasion they asked him to disclose his formula. Year after year, he pleasantly refused. However, on his 75th birthday, his friends, half-jokingly and half-seriously, once again asked if he would disclose the secret. You have been so wonderful to me over the years that I now will tell you, he said. You see, in addition to the formulas used by other cosmeticians, I added the magic ingredient. What is the magic ingredient, he was asked. I never promised a woman that my cosmetics would make her beautiful, but I always gave her hope. Hope is the magic ingredient. Hope is a desire with the expectation of obtaining what is desired and belief that it is obtainable. A person consciously reacts to that which to him is desirable, believable, and attainable. And he also subconsciously reacts to the inner urge that induces action when environmental suggestion, self-suggestion, or auto-suggestion cause the release of the powers of his subconscious mind. His response to suggestion may develop obedience that is direct, neutral, or in reverse action to a specific symbol. In other words, there may be various types and degrees of motivating factors. Every result has a given cause. Your every act is the result of a given cause, your motives. Hope, for example, motivated the cosmetic manufacturer to build a profitable business. Hope also motivated women to buy his cosmetics. Hope will motivate you too. The 10 Basic Motives Which Inspire All Human Action Every thought you think, every act in which you voluntarily engage can be traced back to some definite motive or combination of motives. There are 10 basic motives which inspire all thoughts, all voluntary actions. No one ever does anything without having been motivated to do it. When it comes to learning how to motivate yourself for any given purpose or how to motivate others, you should have a clear understanding of these ten basic motives. Here they are. 1. The desire for self-preservation. 2. The emotion of love. 3. The emotion of fear. 4. The emotion of sex. 5. The desire for life after death. 6. The desire for freedom of body and mind. 7. The emotion of anger. 8. The emotion of hate. 9. The desire for recognition and self-expression. 10. The desire for material gain. As you have been listening to this chapter, perhaps you felt that it contains food for thought. A good sandwich contains nine-tenths bread and one-tenth meat. Unlike a sandwich, this chapter is nine-tenths meat. That is the way the authors planned it. We hope you will chew and digest it carefully. Are negative emotions good? As you listen to success through a positive mental attitude, you clearly see that negative emotions, feelings, and thoughts are harmful to the individual. But are there times when these are good? Yes. Negative emotions, feelings, thoughts, and attitudes are good at the proper time and under the right circumstances. For that which is good for the species of man is good for the individual. It is clear that in the process of evolution, negative thoughts, feelings, emotions, and attitudes protected the individual. In fact, these negatives prevented the species of man from becoming extinct. And these negatives in a person, like the negative forces of a bar magnet, effectively repelled the forces of the negative powers of others. This has been, and because it is a universal law, it will continue to be. Now culture, refinement, and civilization, like man himself, have also evolved from a primitive state. And the more cultured, refined, and civilized a society or environment may be, the less need there is for the individual to use these negatives. But in a negative, antagonistic environment, a person with common sense will use these negative forces with PMA to oppose the evil with which he is faced. And because you live in a country with laws designed to bring the greatest good to the greatest number, 
because the rights of the individual are protected, because you are in a society and environment of culture, refinement, and the highest form of civilization, those negative thoughts, feelings, emotions, and passions which lie dormant within you from your hereditary past are not now necessary to solve the problems which primitive man could not otherwise have solved. For he was a law unto himself. And the law of the individual has become subservient to the law of society for his benefit. Now let's clarify these concepts. Let's take anger, hate, and fear as examples. Anger and Hate Righteous indignation against evil is a form of anger and hate. The desire to protect one's nation when attacked by an enemy, or the desire to protect the weak against the criminal attack of the madman to save human life is good. To kill to accomplish this, when necessary, is an example of the worst form of all negative feelings and emotions used to achieve a worthy purpose. In our society, the patriotism of a soldier or the fulfillment of duty by a police officer are virtues. Fear With every new experience and in every new environment, nature protects you from potential danger by alerting you through some shade of the emotion of fear. You can be assured that the bravest individual will, in a new environment at first, experience an awareness that is a conscious or subconscious feeling of timidity or fear. If he finds that the fears are not beneficial to him, the person with PMA will neutralize an undesirable negative emotion by substituting a positive one. What can you do about it? Man is the only member of the animal kingdom who, through the functioning of his conscious mind, can voluntarily control his emotions from within rather than be forced to do so by external influences. And he alone can deliberately change habits of emotional response. The more civilized, cultured, and refined you are, the more easily you can control your emotions and feelings if you choose to do so. Emotions are controlled through the combination of reason and action. When fears are unwarranted or harmful, they can and should be neutralized. How? While your emotions are not always immediately subject to reason, nonetheless, they are immediately subject to action. For you can use reason to determine the needlessness of the negative emotion and thus motivate yourself to action. You can substitute fear with a positive feeling. How do you do this? One effective means is through self-suggestion, in fact, self-command, with a one-word symbol that incorporates what you want to be. Thus, if you are afraid and want to be courageous, give the self-command, Be courageous with rapidity several times. Follow this with action. If you want to be courageous, act courageously. How? Use the self-starter, Do It Now, and then get into action. In this and the next chapter, you will see how to control your emotions and actions by using self-suggestions. In the meantime, keep your mind on the things you should and do want and off the things you shouldn't and don't want. A Success Formula That Always Succeeds When Applied Are you among the hundreds of thousands of persons throughout the world who have read the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin? or among the tens of thousands who have read Frank Betker's book, How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. If not, we recommend that you read both. These books contain a formula that always succeeds when applied with PMA. In his autobiography, Franklin indicates that he endeavored to help Benjamin Franklin just as the most important living person wants to help you. He wrote, Language Modernized, my intention being to acquire the habit of all these virtues, I judged it would be well not to distract my attention by attempting the whole at once, but to fix it on one of them at a time, and when I should be master of that, then to proceed to another, and so on, until I should have gone through the thirteen. And as the previous acquisition of some might facilitate the acquisition of certain others, I arranged them with that view." The names of these virtues as Franklin listed them, together with the precepts, self-motivators for self-suggestion he gave each one, are 1. Temperance 
Eat not to dullness, drink not to elevation. 2. Silence. Speak not but what may benefit others or yourself. Avoid trifling conversation. 3. Order. Let all your things have their places. Let each part of your business have its time. 4. Resolution. Resolve to perform what you ought. Perform without fail what you resolve. 5. Frugality. Make no expense but to do good to others or yourself, that is, waste nothing. 6. Industry. Lose no time. Be always employed in something useful. Cut off all unnecessary actions. 7. Sincerity. Use no hurtful deceit. Think innocently and justly, and, if you speak, speak accordingly. 8. Justice. Wrong none by doing injuries or omitting the benefits that are your duty. 9. Moderation. Avoid extremes. Forbear resenting injuries so much as you think they deserve. 10. Cleanliness. Tolerate no uncleanliness in body, clothes, or habitation. 11. Tranquility. Be not disturbed at trifles or at accidents, common or unavoidable. 12. Chastity. Rarely use venery but for health or offspring, never to dullness, weakness, or the injury of your own or another's peace or reputation. 13. Humility. Imitate Jesus and Socrates. Franklin wrote further, Conceiving then that, agreeably to the advice of Pythagoras in his golden verses, daily examination would be necessary, I contrived the following method for conducting that examination. I made a little book, in which I allotted a page for each of the virtues. I ruled each page with red ink, so as to have seven columns, one for each day of the week, marking each column with a letter for the day. I crossed these columns with thirteen red lines, marking the beginning of each line with the first letter of one of the virtues, on which line, and in its proper column, I might mark by a little black spot every fault I found upon examination to have been committed respecting that virtue upon that day. Now, it is as important to know how to use a formula as it is to know the formula. Here's how to use your knowledge. A Formula in Action 1. Concentrate on one principle for an entire week, every day of the week. Respond by proper action every time an occasion arises. 2. And then, start the second week on the second principle or virtue. Let the first be taken over by your subconscious mind. Should an occasion arise when the employment of a previous principle flashes into your conscious mind, use the self-starter, do it now, and then act. Continue to concentrate on one principle at a time each week, and leave the others to be executed by the habits established in your subconscious as the occasion arises. 3. When the series is completed, start over again. Thus, at the end of a year, you will have completed the entire cycle four times. 4. When you have acquired a desired characteristic, substitute a new principle for a new virtue, attitude, or activity that you may wish to develop. Now, you have just heard the method Benjamin Franklin used to help Benjamin Franklin. As success through a positive mental attitude is a self-help book, it would be wise for you to study Franklin's method and see how you can apply the principles. In the chapter entitled, How to Motivate Others, you will see how Frank Betker raised himself from failure to success by employing Benjamin Franklin's plan. If you decide to start your own plan and don't know exactly what principles to start with, you could begin with the 13 virtues used by Benjamin Franklin, or you may prefer the 17 success principles described in Chapter 2. Now for some bread for your sandwich. Let's tell about the first Fuller Brush Man. Alfred C. Fuller, the first of the Fuller Brush Men, came from a poor farm family living in Nova Scotia. Al couldn't seem to hold a job. In fact, during the first two years of trying to earn a living, he lost three jobs. 
But then a radical change came into Fuller's life, for he tried selling brushes. Right then, Fuller was motivated. He began to realize that his first three jobs were not the kind of work suited to him. He didn't like them. The work didn't come to him naturally, but selling did. And he saw immediately that he would do well as a salesman. He liked his work. So Al conditioned his mind to do the best selling job in the world. He was terrific. And having succeeded as a salesman, he set a goal in his climb up the ladder of success. It was to go in business for himself. Now this goal fitted nicely with his personality, provided he was in sales. Alfred C. Fuller did quit selling brushes for someone else, and he had more fun than ever before. He manufactured his own brushes in the evening, then sold them the next day. And when his sales began to mount, he rented space in an old shed for $11 a month and hired an assistant who made the brushes for him while he concentrated on sales. The end result from the boy who lost his first three jobs? The Fuller Brush Company, with thousands of door-to-door -door salesmen and millions of dollars in annual income. You see, you are more apt to succeed if you do what comes naturally. But there are greater motivating factors than losing a job making money, or success in business. The desire for self-preservation is the strongest on the list. Seven came through. Captain Edward V. Rickenbacker was one of the most successful and highly esteemed men in the United States. Captain Eddie, as he was affectionately called, is a symbol of faith, integrity, the joy of hard work, and common sense. Those who met him, heard his lectures, or read his book, Seven Came Through, are themselves inspired by the symbol he represents. The airplane carrying Captain Eddie and his crew fell into the Pacific. No trace of the wreckage or the men could be found the first week, nor the second week. But the world was thrilled with the news that Captain Eddie was saved on the 21st day. Just picture Captain Eddie and his crew on three rafts in the Pacific with nothing in sight but the sea and the sky. Picture these men, if you will, suffering from the shock of hitting the water when their plane crash landed, suffering from the heat of the burning sun, hungry, thirsty. Then picture the three rafts tied together each morning and evening, with each member of the crew bowing his head in prayer or listening intently as the 23rd Psalm or the verses from Matthew 6, 31-34 were read. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or, What shall we drink? Or, Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now you have the picture, so let's hear directly from Captain Eddie himself as he wrote in his book. As I have already stated, there was no time that I lost faith in our ultimate rescue. But the others did not seem to share this state of mind fully with me. My companions clearly began to think of what lay beyond death, and to think of it in terms of their own lives. I say in all truth that at no time did I ever doubt we would be saved. I tried to impart my own philosophy to these men, hoping to stimulate their desire to carry on. It was based upon the simple observation that the longer I have had to suffer under trying circumstances, the more certain I was to appreciate my deliverance. This is part of the wisdom that comes to older men. Should you ask us how to motivate yourself, we would list the basic motives. They are repeated here. First, the desire for self-preservation. Then, the emotions of love, fear, sex. The desire for life after death and freedom of body and mind would follow. And after that, the emotions of anger and hate, then the desire for recognition and self-expression, and last in the list of the ten basic motives would be the desire for material wealth. In the following chapter, you will see how any one of these or a combination motivates others. 
Pilot number nine. Thoughts to steer by. One. Motivation is that which induces action or determines choice. It is the hope or other force which starts an action in an attempt to produce specific results. Two. Motivate yourself with PMA. Remember, what the mind of man can conceive and believe, the mind of man can achieve with PMA. Recognize the possibility of the improbable. Three, hope is the magic ingredient in motivating yourself and others. Four, negative emotions, feelings, thoughts, and attitudes are good at the proper time and under the right circumstances. Five. The ten basic motives are self-preservation, love, fear, sex, desire for life after death, freedom of body and mind, anger, hate, desire for recognition and self-expression, and the desire for material wealth. Six, motivate yourself as Benjamin Franklin motivated himself. Develop your own chart. Do it now. If you have difficulty listing thirteen virtues you would like to acquire or goals you would like to reach, you can start with one and then add to your list as you realize what virtues or goals you desire. Like Benjamin Franklin, have a self motivator for each. Important: inspect your progress daily. Seven, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker had developed a strong faith that came to his rescue in time of need. How can you strengthen your faith to help you at the time of your greatest need? Eight, are you prepared so that you can and will apply your faith at the time of your greatest need? Hope is the magic ingredient in motivating yourself and others. Chapter Ten: How to Motivate Others. It is important to know how to motivate others in an effective manner. And in a desirable direction. Throughout life, you play dual parts in which you motivate others and they motivate you: parent and child, teacher and pupil, salesman and buyer, master and servant. You take each part. How a child motivated his father. A boy two and one half years of age was walking with his father after a very heavy Christmas Day dinner. When they had walked about a block and a half, the youngster stopped, looked up at his father with a smile, and said, "Daddy," then hesitated. His father responded, "Yes." The boy paused for a second or two and continued, "If you say please, I'll let you carry me." Now, who could resist this type of motivation? Even a newborn baby motivates his parents to action, and of course, a parent motivates a child. We saw this illustrated by Thomas Edison and his mother. Having confidence in a youngster gives him confidence in himself. When the child feels that he is wrapped in the warm, secure belief that he will do well, he is actually able to do better than he knows. His defenses are relaxed, his guard down. He is able to stop spending emotional energy protecting himself from the possible hurts of failure. Instead, he spends his energy reaching for the probable rewards of success. He is relaxed. Confidence has had a measurable effect on his ability. It has brought out the best in him. My mother was the making of me," said Edison. And Napoleon Hill himself had an experience in this direction. He speaks about it in this way: When I was a youngster, I was considered to be a hellion. Whenever a cow was let loose from her pasture, or a dam broken, or a tree cut down mysteriously, it was young Napoleon Hill that everyone suspected. And furthermore, there was some justification for all this suspicion. My own mother was dead, and my father and brothers thought I was bad, so I really was pretty bad. If people considered me this way, I was not going to disappoint them. And then one day, my father announced that he was going to remarry. All of us were worried about what kind of a new mother we were going to have, but I, in particular, was bound and determined that no new mother coming into our home would be able to find a place in my heart. The day finally came when this strange woman entered our home. My father stood back and let her handle the situation in her own way. She went around the room and greeted each of us cheerfully, 
that is, until she came to me. I stood straight as a ramrod, with my hands folded over my chest, and glared at her without the least suggestion of welcome in my eyes. And this is Napoleon, my father said, the worst boy in the hills. And with that, I'll never forget what my stepmother did. She put both hands on my shoulders and looked me straight in the eye with a twinkle in her own eyes that I shall hold dear forever. The worst boy, she said. Not at all. He's just the brightest boy in these hills, and all we have to do is bring that out in him. My stepmother was always the one who encouraged me to strike out on my own with such bold schemes as later proved the backbone of my career. I will never forget the great lesson she taught me in how to motivate others by giving them confidence in themselves. For my stepmother was the making of me. Her deep love and unshakable faith motivated me to try to become the kind of boy she believed me to be. So you can motivate others by having faith in them. Faith, rightly understood, is active, not passive. Passive faith is no more a force than sight is in an eye that does not observe. Active faith steps out on its belief and risks failure because it assumes it will succeed. When you motivate others by having faith in them, then you must have an active faith. You must commit your belief. You must say, I know that you are going to succeed in this job, so I have committed myself and others to your success. We are here, waiting for you. When you have that kind of faith in another man, he will succeed. Now, faith can be expressed in a letter. In fact, a letter is an excellent tool for expressing one's thoughts and motivating another person. A letter can change a life for the better. Anyone who writes a letter affects the subconscious mind of the receiver through suggestion. And the power of this suggestion is, of course, dependent upon several factors. If you are a parent, for example, and your son or daughter is away at school, you can accomplish that which you might not otherwise achieve. You can grasp the opportunity, A, to mold the character of your child, B, to discuss matters that you might hesitate or never take the time to discuss in conversation, and C, to express your inner thoughts. Now, a boy or girl may not readily accept advice when it is given verbally, for environment and emotions involved at the time of the conversation might prevent this. And yet, the same boy or girl would treasure the same advice received in a carefully written, sincere letter. To a son or daughter away from home, a letter with all of its contents, including advice, is most welcome. And if it is properly written, it may be read frequently, studied, and digested. And the executive or sales manager who writes the right type of letter to his salesman can motivate them to break all previous records. Likewise, the salesman who writes his sales manager will benefit from this tool of motivation. Now, to write a letter, one must think. Therefore, the writer should crystallize his ideas on paper, and he can ask questions to direct the recipient's mind in the desired channels. In fact, he can ask a question to obtain a letter in return. Or, when the person he would like to hear from does not write, he, like an advertising expert, can use a bait. That's what J. Pierpont Morgan did. One Way to Motivate a College Student to Write J. Pierpont Morgan proved there is at least one way to get college students to answer a letter. His sister had complained that her two college sons just wouldn't write home. Mr. Morgan said that he could get the boys to respond immediately if he sent a letter. And then his sister challenged him to prove it. So he wrote each nephew and received an immediate reply from both. Surprised, his sister asked, How did you do it? Morgan handed the letters to her, and she saw that both contained interesting information about college life and thoughts of home. But the postscript on each was similar. One read, The ten dollars you said was enclosed in your letter wasn't received. Motivate by Example a successful sales manager knows that one of the most effective means to motivate a salesman is to set an example when working with him in the field. W. Clement Stone has inspired many people with the story he tells about how he trained a salesman who lived in Sioux City, Iowa. Here's the way he tells it. 
I listened to one of our salesmen at Sioux City, Iowa, gripe for over two hours one evening. Now, he kept on telling how he had worked for two days at Sioux Center without making a sale. He said, It's impossible to sell at Sioux Center because the people there are Holland Dutch. They're clannish, and they won't buy from a stranger. Besides, the territory has had a crop failure for five years. I suggested that we sell the next day at Sioux Center, the town where he had worked for two days without making a sale. So the next morning, we drove to Sioux Center. For there I intended to prove that the salesman with PMA who believed in and used our company's system could sell regardless of the obstacles. And while the salesman was driving, I closed my eyes, relaxed, meditated, and conditioned my mind. I kept my mind on the reasons why I should and would sell these people rather than why I wouldn't or couldn't. Here's what I thought. He says that they are Holland Dutch and clannish, therefore they won't buy. That's good. What's so good about it? It's a well-known fact that if you sell one of a clan, particularly a leader, you can sell the entire clan. Now all I have to do is to make the first sale to the right person. I'll do it even if it takes a long time. Again, he claims that the territory has had a crop failure for five years. What could be more wonderful? The Holland Dutch are marvelous people, and they save their money. Also, they are responsible and want to protect their families and property. And as a matter of fact, they probably have not purchased accident insurance from any other insurance salesman because other salesmen wouldn't even try. For they, like the salesman with whom I am driving, would have a negative mental attitude. Our policies offer excellent protection at a low cost. Actually, I'll find no competition. I then engaged in what I term mind conditioning. I repeated to myself with reverence, sincerity, expectation, and emotion, Please God, help me sell. Please God, help me sell. Please God, help me sell. Over and over again I repeated, Please God, help me sell. Then I took a nap. And when we arrived at Sioux Center, we called at the bank. Now the personnel consisted of a vice president, a cashier, and a teller. Within twenty minutes, the vice president had purchased the most protection our company was willing to sell, a full unit. And the cashier purchased a full unit. But the teller will never be forgotten by me because he didn't buy. And starting with the first place of business next to the bank, we began cold canvassing systematically, store after store, office after office. We interviewed every individual in each establishment. An amazing thing happened. Every person we called on that day purchased the full unit, and there was no exception. While riding back to Sioux City, I thanked the divine power for the assistance I had received. Now why did I succeed in selling in the same place where the other man had failed? Actually, I experienced success for exactly the same reasons that he had experienced failure, except for the something more. He said it was impossible to sell them because they were Holland Dutch and clannish. That's NMA. Now I knew they would buy because they were Holland Dutch and clannish. That's PMA. Again, he said it was impossible to sell them because they had had a crop failure for five years. That's NMA. I knew they would buy because they had had a crop failure for five years. And that's PMA. Now the something more was the difference between PMA and NMA. For I had asked for divine guidance and help. What's more, I believed that I was receiving it. Now this salesman returned to Sioux Center and stayed for a long time and each day that he was there was a record day in sales for him. This illustrates the value of motivating another person by example, for this salesman also succeeded where he had failed because he learned the value of working with a positive mental attitude. There are many ways to motivate a person, but a most effective way is through an inspirational book. When you want to motivate, say it with an inspirational self-help action book. The most important factors to success in selling are in order of importance A. Inspiration to action B. Knowledge of a successful sales technique for the particular product or service which is termed know-how and C. Knowledge of the product or service itself 
activity knowledge. Now, these same three principles can be related to success in any business or profession. In the story that you have just heard, you can assume that the salesman had knowledge of the sales know-how and knowledge of the service he was selling. But he did lack the most important ingredient, inspiration to action. Many years ago, Morris Pickus, a well-known sales executive and sales counselor, gave W. Clement Stone a copy of Think and Grow Rich. Since then, he has used inspirational books such as those mentioned in Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude to help salesmen develop inspiration to action. Mr. Stone knows that inspiration and enthusiasm are the life of a sales organization, and because the flame of inspiration and enthusiasm will be extinguished unless the fuel that feeds it is kept replenished, Mr. Stone has made it a habit to see that his representatives receive inspirational self-help action books frequently. And this is in addition to weekly and monthly publications that are intended to act as mental vitamins. If you know what motivates a person, you can motivate him. As a boy, Walter Clark of Walter Clark Associates, Providence, Rhode Island, intended to be a doctor. But when he grew older, he thought he wanted to become an engineer, and he studied engineering. At Columbia University, however, he found the study of the functioning of the human mind so interesting and challenging that he changed from engineering to psychology, and finally he received his master's degree. Walter Clark worked as a personnel officer in Macy's department store and several other well-known concerns. At that time, the known psychological tests developed the specific information for which they were intended, an applicant's IQ, aptitude, and personality. But something important was missing. Walter endeavored to find the missing factor. He thought, an engineer can select the proper part and put it in its place so that a machine will function efficiently. And that is exactly what I want to do with people. I want to select the right person for the right job. You see, Walter, like many personnel officers, found people fail on their job even though their psychological tests indicated that they had sufficient intelligence, aptitude, and personality to succeed on the job. Why then do we have so much absenteeism, turnover, and failure, he asked himself. What's the missing factor? Now, the answer to this question became so simple and obvious that it is truly amazing that other psychologists had not discovered it. For you see, a person is more than a mechanical body. He is a mind with a body. He succeeds or fails because he is, or is not, motivated. Therefore, Walter endeavored to develop an analysis technique that would a indicate the individual's tendencies and behavior in either a pleasant or antagonistic environment. b. Show the sort of environment that attracts and repels him under favorable or unfavorable situations. c. In essence, indicate what comes naturally to the individual. Also, he endeavored to develop a technique that could be used to analyze the requirements of a given job successfully. And because he worked hard and continued to search, Walter Clark found and recognized exactly what he was looking for. For he developed what he called activity vector analysis, better known as AVA. It is based on semantics, specifically, the reaction of the individual to word symbols. From the answers given by the applicant, Clark designed a chart and he likewise came up with a formula for designing a similar diagram for any specific job. Now, when the diagram of the applicant corresponded with that of the job, he had a perfect combination. Why? For then the applicant would have a job doing the kind of work that came naturally to him, and a person will do what he likes to do. It's fun. Now, the sole purpose of AVA, as conceived by Walter Clark, is to help business management in... A. The selection of personnel. B. Management development. C. Cutting the high cost of absenteeism. D. Personnel turnover. Walter Clark achieved a definite major aim. Now, for many years, W. Clement Stone kept searching for a scientific working tool that could aid him in his efforts to help the representatives under his supervision to achieve success in solving their personal, family, social, 
and business problems. He was looking for a simple, accurate, and usable formula that would eliminate guesswork and save time when applied to a specific individual in a given environment. Therefore, when we heard of AVA, Mr. Stone investigated and immediately recognized that it was a working tool that he had so long been looking for. He could see that AVA might be used for purposes far beyond that for which it was conceived, and when he studied under Walter Clark, his conclusions were confirmed. For when you know, A, what the personality traits of the individual are, B, what his environment is, C, what motivates him, you then can motivate that individual. How to Motivate Another Person While listening to success through a positive mental attitude, you have seen the importance of semantics, word symbols, suggestion, self-suggestion, and auto-suggestion. This was particularly true when you heard Chapter 4. Now Mr. Stone combined this knowledge with what he learned from ABA and thus he made what to him was a great discovery in the technique of motivating other persons. For the discovery was, with PMA, you can be what you want to be if you are willing to pay the price. This is true regardless of your past experiences, aptitude, IQ, or environment. Remember, you have the power to choose. Now, you don't have to study AVA to learn how to motivate yourself and others, but it could certainly help you for you can use the proper technique when you know what motivates an individual. And the simple technique that you can use to help you motivate yourself and others is based on the use of suggestion, self-suggestion, and auto-suggestion. Let's be specific. 1. If, for example, a salesman is timid and his job requires him to be aggressive, then a. The sales manager uses reason to point out that timidity and fear are natural. He proves that others have overcome timidity. He then recommends that the salesman state to himself frequently a word or self-motivator that would symbolize what the salesman wants to be. B. And in this instance, the salesman would repeat every morning and other times throughout the day the following words with rapidity and frequency. Be aggressive. Be aggressive. He would particularly do so if he had a feeling of timidity in a specific environment where it was necessary to act. In such an instance, he would act on the self-starter, do it now. 2. When a sales manager discovers that one of his men is deceitful or dishonest, he will have a talk with his representative. And if he sees the representative wants to cure the fault, then a. The sales manager tells how others have solved this difficulty. He gives the salesman an inspirational book, article, poem, or recommends specific Bible passages. We have found that books like I Can by Ben Sweetland and I Dare You by William Danforth are particularly effective. B. And in such an instance, as in B above, the salesman would repeat, Be truthful, be truthful, with rapidity every morning and at frequent intervals throughout the day. He would particularly do so at the time that he was tempted to be dishonest or engage in deception in a specific environment where it was necessary for him to make a decision. He would act on the self-motivator, have the courage to face the truth, as well as the self-starter, do it now. Now this plan should be easy for you to understand, as it is illustrated frequently throughout this book, and because you understand its effectiveness, you yourself will use it. And in addition, you, unlike the hundreds of thousands of persons who have read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, will now immediately use Franklin's method to achieve success. You, unlike them, have been given the secret of getting things done. Do it now. Use Franklin's method to achieve results. Yes, many hundreds of thousands of persons have read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, yet they didn't learn how to use the success principles contained in it. But at least one man did, Frank Betker. He listened to the messages that were applicable to him, for he had a problem. He was a failure in business, and he was searching for a workable, down-to-earth formula that would help him help himself. And because he knew what he was looking for, 
he discovered Franklin's secret. Franklin indicated that he owed all of his success and happiness to just one idea, a formula for personal achievement. Now, Betker recognized that formula and used it. What happened? He raised himself from failure to success. He tells us about it in his great motivating book, How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. Now, why shouldn't you use Franklin's formula for personal achievement? You can, if you will. If the authors of this book succeed in motivating you to use this one idea, you too will, like Betker, be able to raise yourself from failure to success. Or, if you are not a failure, then you will, through the use of Franklin's method, be able to obtain what you seek, be it wisdom, virtue, happiness, health, or wealth. Now, Betker wrote out his objectives on 13 separate cards. The first one is entitled Enthusiasm. The self-motivator is to be enthusiastic, act enthusiastic. As the great teacher and psychologist William James has so conclusively proved, the emotions are not immediately subject to reason, but they are always immediately subject to action. And the action can be physical or it can be mental. A thought can be just as stimulating and effective as a deed in changing an emotion from negative to positive. In such an instance, the act, be it physical or mental, precedes the emotion. See how the plan works. Because the purpose of this book is to help you help yourself, and because the authors want you to get into action, we shall now illustrate how we motivate individuals in an audience to action through the Franklin Betker system. Here's how we have motivated many thousands of students to apply the Franklin Betker plan using the card Enthusiasm and the Self-Motivator to Be Enthusiastic, Act Enthusiastic. We call a student to the front of the class and give him a simple yet effective lesson that he will learn immediately. Here's how we do it. Try it. Here is the dialogue that would take place between the instructor and student. Do you want to feel enthusiastic? Yes. Then learn the self-motivator. To be enthusiastic, act enthusiastic. Now repeat this phrase. To be enthusiastic, act enthusiastic. Right. What is the key word in the affirmation? Act. That's right. Let's paraphrase the message and thus you will learn the principle and be able to relate and assimilate it into your own life. If you want to be sick, what do you do? Act sick. You're right. If you want to be melancholy, what do you do? Act melancholy. Right again. And if you want to be enthusiastic, what do you do? To be enthusiastic, act enthusiastic. We then proceed to point out that you can relate this self-motivator to any desirable virtue or personal aim. Thus, we might take justice as an example, and a card could read, To be just, act just. And then the instructor would proceed. Remember, when someone else's idea is accepted by you, it becomes your idea for your use. You own it. Now I want you to talk in an enthusiastic tone of voice. I want you to act enthusiastically. To speak enthusiastically, do the following. 1. Talk loudly. This is particularly necessary if you are emotionally upset, if you are shaking inside when you stand before an audience, if you have butterflies in your stomach. 2. Talk rapidly. Your mind functions more quickly when you do. You can read two books with greater understanding in the time you now read one if you concentrate and read with rapidity. 3. Emphasize. Emphasize important words, words that are important to you or your listening audience. A word like you, for example. 4. Hesitate. When you talk rapidly, hesitate where there would be a period, comma, or other punctuation in the written word. Thus you employ the dramatic effect of silence. The mind of the person who is listening catches up with the thoughts you have expressed. Hesitation after a word which you wish to emphasize accentuates the emphasis. 5. Keep a smile in your voice. Thus, in talking loudly and rapidly, 
you eliminate gruffness. You can put a smile in your voice by putting a smile on your face, a smile in your eyes. 6. Modulate This is important if you are speaking for a long period. Remember, you can modulate both pitch and volume. You can speak loudly and intermittently change to a conversational tone and a lower pitch if you wish. 7. When the butterflies stop flying around in your stomach, you can then speak in an enthusiastic, conversational tone of voice. Do it now. Now, in the previous chapter, you have heard the 13 principles used by Benjamin Franklin, and here you have been told that enthusiasm is the first of the 13 principles used by Frank Betker, and you know that a positive mental attitude is the first of the 17 success principles. Therefore, if you have not already done so, start the first of your own 17 cards with the heading, Develop a Positive Mental Attitude. Follow through with a card for each of the 17 success principles, and use Franklin's method to achieve results. Your action on the self-starter Do It Now at this time would prove conclusively that you can motivate yourself. You can. And if you purposely motivate yourself, you will find it easy to motivate others. And now that you know how to motivate yourself and others, you are ready to receive the key to the Citadel of Wealth. The next chapter answers the question, Is there a shortcut to riches? Pilot number 10. Thoughts to steer by. 1. Throughout life, you play dual parts in which you motivate others and they motivate you. Learn and apply the art of motivation with PMA. 2. Motivate others to have confidence in themselves by showing them that you have faith in them and faith in yourself. 3. A letter can change a life for the better. Start the habit of motivating your loved ones by writing letters containing wholesome, good suggestions. 4. Motivate others by example. 5. When you want to motivate, say it with an inspirational self-help action book. 6. If you know what motivates a person, you can motivate him if you learn the art of motivation with PMA. 7. Motivate others by suggestion. Motivate yourself by self-suggestion. 8. While your emotions are not always subject to reason, nonetheless, they are subject to action. If there is an instance you recall in which you might experience the emotion of fear, what action do you think you could take to neutralize it? 9. To become enthusiastic, act enthusiastically. 10. To speak enthusiastically and overcome timidity and fear. A. Talk loudly. B. Talk rapidly. C. Emphasize important words. D. Hesitate where there is a period, comma, or other punctuation in the written word. E. Keep a smile in your voice so that it isn't gruff. And F. Use modulation. 11. Start the first of your 17 PMA success cards. Do it now. Anything in life worth working for is worth praying for. Part 3. Your Key to the Citadel of Wealth Chapter 11. Is There a Shortcut to Riches? Is there a shortcut to riches? A shortcut is defined as a way of accomplishing something more directly and quickly than by ordinary procedure. It is a route more direct than that ordinarily taken. And the man who takes the shortcut knows his destination. He knows the route that is more direct, yet he will never arrive at his destination unless he starts and continues toward it regardless of the interruptions he encounters or the obstacles he meets. In Chapter 2, we listed the 17 success principles as 1. A positive mental attitude 2. Definiteness of purpose 3. Going the extra mile 4. Accurate thinking 5. Self-discipline 6. The mastermind 7. 
Applied Faith 8. A Pleasing Personality 9. Personal Initiative 10. Enthusiasm 11. Controlled Attention 12. Teamwork 13. Learning from Defeat 14. Creative Vision 15. Budgeting Time and Money 16. Maintaining Sound Physical and Mental Health 17. Using Cosmic Habit Force Now why do we repeat the 17 success principles? We want to show you the shortcut to riches. We want you to take the most direct route. Now to take the most direct route, you must necessarily think with PMA. And a positive mental attitude results from the application of these success principles. The word think is a symbol. Its meaning for you depends upon who you are. Who are you? You are the product of your heredity, environment, physical body, conscious and subconscious mind, experience, and particular position and direction in time and space, and something more, including powers known and unknown. When you think with PMA, you can affect, use, control, or harmonize with all of them. Now only you can think for you. Therefore, the shortcut to riches for you can be expressed in a six-word symbol. Think with PMA and grow rich. For if you really think with PMA, you will automatically follow through with action. You will employ the PMA principles expressed in this book, principles that will help you achieve any goal that doesn't violate the laws of God or the rights of your fellow men. Pilot number 11. A Thought to Steer By A Shortcut to Riches Think with PMA and Grow Rich If you have PMA, you can do it if you believe you can. Chapter 12. Attract, Don't Repel, Wealth Whoever you are, regardless of your age, your education, or your occupation, you can attract wealth. You can also repel it. We say, attract, don't repel, wealth. This chapter tells you how you can make money. Would you like to be rich? Be truthful with yourself. Of course you would. Or, are you afraid to be rich? Perhaps you're sick, and because of this, you don't try to acquire wealth. If this be the case, just remember the experience of Milo C. Jones, about whom you heard in Chapter 2. Or, if you are a patient in a hospital, you can attract wealth by engaging in study, thinking, and planning time as George Steffick did. In a hospital bed, think. Time after time, as we have studied the careers of successful men, we have discovered that they date their own success from the day they picked up a self-improvement book. Never underestimate the value of a book. Books are tools providing instruction which can launch you onto a bold new program and which can also light the dark days that any such program entails. George Steffick was convalescing at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Hines, Illinois. There he discovered by accident the value of thinking time. Financially, he was broke. While George was convalescing, he had a great deal of time on his hands. There wasn't too much to do except read and think. He read, Think and Grow Rich, and he was ready. An idea occurred to him. Many laundries George knew fold their newly ironed shirts over a piece of cardboard to keep the shirts stiff and free from wrinkles. By writing a few letters, George learned that these shirt boards cost the laundries about $4 per thousand. His idea was to sell the boards for $1 a thousand. However, each one would carry an advertisement. The advertisers would, of course, pay for the space, and George would make a profit. George had an idea, and he tried to make it work. When he left the hospital, he got into action. New in the advertising field, he had his problems, but he finally developed successful sales techniques through what others term trial and error, and we term trial and success. 
George continued the custom he had started in the hospital to engage in study, thinking, and planning time each day. Even when George's business was moving ahead swiftly, he decided to increase his sales by increasing the efficiency of his service. The shirt boards, when withdrawn from the shirts, were not retained by the laundry's customers. Now he asked himself the question, how can I get families to keep these shirt boards with the advertisements on them? The solution flashed into his mind. What did he do? On one side of the shirt board, he continued to print an advertisement in black and white or in colors. On the other side, he added something new, an interesting game for the children, a delicious recipe for the wife, or a provocative crossword puzzle for the whole family. George tells about one husband who complained that his laundry bill had gone up in a sudden, unaccountable way. Then he discovered that his wife was sending in shirts to the laundry, which ordinarily he would have worn another day, just to get more of George's recipes. But George didn't stop there. He was ambitious. He wanted to expand his business still further. Again, he asked himself the question, how? And he found the answer. George Steffick gave the entire $1 per thousand he received from the laundries to the American Institute of Laundering. The Institute, in turn, recommended that each member help himself and his trade association by using George Steffick's shirt boards exclusively. And thus, George made another important discovery. The more you give of that which is good and desirable, the more you get. Now, a carefully planned thinking time session brought George Steffick considerable wealth. He discovered that a time apart is essential to any successful attraction of riches. It is in quiet that our best ideas occur to us. Don't make the mistake of believing that by a frantic kind of dashing around, you are being your most effective and efficient self. Don't assume that you are wasting time when you take time out for thought. Thought is the foundation upon which all else is built by man. Now, it isn't necessary for you to go to a hospital to establish the habit of reading good motivating books, to think, or to make plans. And your thinking, study, and planning sessions need not be too lengthy. If you invest only 1% of your time in a study, thinking, and planning session, it will make an amazing difference in the speed with which you reach your goals. Your day has 1,440 minutes in it. Invest 1% of that time in a study, thinking, and planning session, and you will be astounded at what those 14 minutes do for you. For it may surprise you to find that when you develop this habit, you will receive constructive ideas almost any time or anywhere you might be, while doing the dishes, or riding the bus, or while taking a bath. Be certain to use two of the greatest yet simplest working tools ever invented. Tools used by a genius like Thomas Edison. A pencil and a piece of paper. For he always had handy paper and pencil. And thus you, like him, will record the ideas that come to you day or night. Another requirement to attract wealth is to learn how to set your goal. It is important for you to understand this. Few people even when they realize its importance, really understand how to set a goal.